Let me begin by first of all acknowledging the help that we receive from the National Parkinson Foundation. We are an NPF center of excellence uh, and we greatly appreciate their confidence in us and their partial support for us. Let me also um, acknowledge the help, the financial support that we receive from Teva. Teva is a drug company, but it gives us a completely unrestricted educational grant, so we decide how to spend it, not them, and on whom and on what. And without their support, it really would not be possible to have this annual conference. So we really are very grateful to Teva for that unrestricted um, grant. A number of people I need to thank also need to thank Aaron Daly, who's the, our NPF clinic coordinator over here, tall guy, um, who's helped arrange all this, put this all together, and dealt with many uh, minor problems to ensure that things I hope will go well today. She was helped by he was helped by Ariane Marcus, who was at one of our research assistants, who recently left, and she's now actually on, on a vacation in the Far East. But uh, again, I must acknowledge uh, our debt to her, and also to Ruth Gabreski, who is um, uh, Ariane Marcus's uh, replacement. So I'm grateful to those three uh, individuals, and also to a number of, uh, of volunteers who have very kindly uh, come to help us today organize this um, uh, meeting. Just in case you don't know, uh, those of you who need the bathrooms, they are out the door here and to the left. There will be a coffee available all the time out the door here and to your right. And there will, uh, at the time of the break, be some sort of refreshments, uh, some food and other uh, things. It's not intended to provide a meal, but it's, entitled, it's intended to be a sort of hors d'oeuvre so that you can, after the conference, go out and celebrate in any manner that you would like to do so. We do have a number of new topics today, although we're dealing with an old disease, a disease that's been known for now many, many years, uh, a disease for which there's been no dramatic breakthrough, I'm afraid, since our meeting last year. We are presenting a number of new additional topics for you this uh, year, and I hope that you'll then find these helpful. Let me begin by introducing our first speaker, who is John Porcelet, who is Professor of Neurological Surgery Research here at UCSF. I have known John for a, a number of years. In fact, when I first met him, he was very much involved in setting up a, a gene therapy trial that was then performed here at UCSF. And we've remained friends over the years since that time. Uh, he works with Dr. Christopher Bankiewicz, again, a basic scientist in the Department of Neurological Surgery. Um, John is going to be talking to us today about why we get Parkinson's disease. So, John. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. And it's a tremendous pleasure to be here because if there's one thing I love to hear, it's the sound of my own voice. So, um, so um, okay, thank you. So, um, why do we get Parkinson's disease? It's really like the question I think everybody, particularly people who have Parkinson's, ask why me? Why did I get Parkinson's disease? Um, and um, I, I wanted to just start with this uh, slide. I hope. Yes. So, actually, this is what we in Parkinson's research are doing. We're like blind men, all feeling a different part of the elephant, and the only way that we can really find out what the elephant is, what it looks like is to cooperate, is to work with each other, to treat each other with the respect that, that we need in order to, um, to see the whole hour. And so any understanding of Parkinson's disease, any comprehensive understanding, can't come from just looking at a leg or a trunk. It's got to be comprehensive and a 
theory of Parkinson's, an explanation of Parkinson's disease that um, that really makes that that hangs together has got to bring everybody in and incorporate everybody's uh, observations. So, you know, that also let requires you that, that you leave your ego at the door, which is kind of tough for people like me. So something to remind myself of, right? Humility is the way to truth, right? Okay, so what we should do here, I think, is to start with the things that we all agree on about Parkinson's disease. And the first thing to remember about Parkinson's disease, it's not primarily a brain disease. Many people in this room know that all too well and all too painfully. So those things, for example, I have this, um, is things like lack of sense of smell, people say they can't taste their food, constipation is an early and <laughs> really unpleasant symptom, I'm sure many of you know that, orthostatic hypertension, when you get up, you feel dizzy and sometimes cold. Um, sleep disorders, sleep becomes very disturbed, depression is really a problem, and ultimately dementia is quite a frequent component later in the disease. Now the thing about this is that's sort of interesting is that it's an anatomically progressive disease. It doesn't start up here, it starts down here. It starts down in your gut and it works its way up into your brain. So if you want to explain where Parkinson's comes from, you have to incorporate and explain the anatomical progression. Why does it start down here and why does it end up there? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Oh, that's right, yeah. Parkinson's is a movement disorder. And you almost forgot, you know, if you think about all of the symptoms that you get peripherally, for a second you almost forget that it's also this movement disorder where you have Resting tremor, bradykinesia, kinesia, that's you know, that's slow movements, and, and then you also get dyskinesias that quite often arise from uh, from taking the Parkinson's drugs. And so this so so our job as scientists is to try and understand how do we fit all this together into a complete theory. And this is sort of reflective of the recent work that I've done, I'm going to tell you what we're looking about today. So this is actually kind of a complicated slide in some respects, but it actually um, covers things. First of all, there are these things here, globs of protein that, that accumulate in neurons in various parts of the body that are affected by Parkinson's disease, and you can use that uh, to stage the progression of the disease. So that's why we know that Parkinson's is anatomically progressive. These blobs of protein appear in neurons in your abdomen first, and then you start to see them further and further up and into the brain stem, etc. And when it gets into the brain, it begins to progress all the way through the brain. It's not just in, in one little segment called the substantia nigra, which makes dopamine, and it's obviously very important, but it's very far from the only thing that is affected in Parkinson's. And this is a very recent study where, um, and where they can image particular classes of neurons, and this is the this is the pancreas of somebody who does not have Parkinson's, and this is where that signal should have been in someone who does. And those neurons in the pancreas secrete acetylcholine. They don't secrete dopamine. They don't secrete any alcoholic. And so that's the next big clue is that Parkinson's disease is not just a disease about dopamine. It's, it's a disease about particular classes of neurons and it's staged in an anatomically um, progressive way. It's very important to remember that. Okay. And this actually is mostly the work that was done by a really great neuroanatomist, um, Heiko Brach in Germany. And this is from a group in Denmark, and I was very excited to see this as I, and I'm going to come back to this picture later on at the end to explain to you why I think it's so important. 
The other thing that people think is that neurons die in Parkinson's disease. They don't. They do not die in Parkinson's disease. This is a um, this is a um, uh, from a paper by uh, Jeff Cordauer and Warren Olinow, and um, they looked at um, pe people who had died at various stages, various times after they had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. These are this is basically what happens to the actual neurons in the and you, and you, in the brain in the substantia nigra, and as some of you may know, they are black. They have this stuff called neuromelanin, and so you could see them. And you only lose maybe ten percent of those. But look at the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase that is involved in essentially making dopamine, and it's gone down by ninety percent. So, so that's the second big clue here. Neurons retract. The, end, the nerve endings shrivel up like leaves falling off a tree. But the trunk of the tree is still there. It's still waiting. Something has gone away that should be there, right? This is not about you know poisoning and killing off neurons. They're still there. So that's the second thing. Okay. A lot of you are going to think, and my, a lot of people here think that Pesticides cause Parkinson's disease. How many people think pe pesticides cause Parkinson's disease? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, let me just show you some of the epidemiology and why I think there's a real problem with the epidemiology of Parkinson's disease. If you do studies about pesticide exposure and you ask someone who has Parkinson's, were you exposed to pesticides? What are they going to say? They're probably going to say yes. Why? Because Parkinson's patients are more than twice as likely as non-Parkinson's patients to believe that pesticides cause Parkinson's disease. So what are you really polling? You're polling their ability to, read, to, to go on, on Google, to go on the internet, on the internet, to talk to their friends. You're asking their opinion. And, the, and so for their studies, those studies tend to support, they're self-reporting, they rely on self-reporting, they tend to say, yes, there is a link. But if you use indirect measures, the answer tends to be no. If you, for example, look at occupational exposure and you look at pesticide usage in various regions, the answer tends to be no. And there are exceptions, okay? So one exception is this study by Ritz and Yu, which looked at county by county exposure because of the reporting requirements in California, where each county has to report its pesticide use, and then actually looked at um, at, uh, at the incidence of Parkinson's. But what was interesting about that is more educated people um, who had lived in the county for less time were had a higher incidence. And that's a puzzling finding because it just doesn't quite seem to make sense. And the authors actually already explain why that discrepancy should uh, occur. It may be that there's a lot of problems in epidemiology because of things like genetics and people moving around, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that, those sorts of issues come into play but the one study that I really have to give big props to is this study by my friend Sam Goldman, who actually lives up the street from me, and Carly Tanner, who basically showed that if you have a mutation, and it's actually quite a common mutation, if you lack this, this gene, this GSTT1, I'm not going to go into what it is, but your risk of of Parkinson's is about 11 fold greater. And I believe this because it was actually a study of people who apply pesticides for a living, and it only was visible in people who sprayed the pesticide paraquat. Not other kinds of pesticides, not other kinds of things, just paraquat. So, so yes, so the answer is complicated. Right? The answer is, you probably didn't get your Parkinson's from spraying the roses that we need that in August, right? But there are people who probably have got Parkinson's or 
their Parkinson's very, made very much worse by being exposed to this, but only under very restrictive conditions, right? So that's my take on it. I'm sure there are people in the audience who are thinking, what a load of rubbish, but let's move. <laughs> okay. There's one thing that we know really has a big effect in experimental models of Parkinson's disease, and it's the basis of a clinical trial that we're now doing at, uh, at NIH, and it's a very interesting growth factor which was discovered in the early 90s called GDNF, and it, it, the name is not really important because it's not even accurate, but it's called GDNF, and this is um, a picture of a, a, a recombinant virus called AD2 that, that uh, directs the synthesis of GDNF, and when you inject that virus into these are monkey brains, this is actually in the region, the, the, the end of cutamen, which is part of the, of the basal ganglia that, that uh, needs dopamine, etc. And so these, um, all of these monkeys, you can see how much GDNF we're actually expressing. There's a lot of GDNF now that we put into these monkey brains. And these monkeys have Parkinson's, experimental Parkinson's, and you can see that um, the ones that got GDNF actually really improved their movement scores. They, they get a lot better, actually. Um, I'm not going to go into all the data because I think that would just uh, be confusing, but these are the animals that just got a control in, uh, injection, but these are the ones that got the vector. Every now and then there's one uncooperative monkey that gets better even though they got a, a control injection. So, you know, there's always one in every crowd, right? But, Nevertheless, this formed the underpinning for this clinical trial that we're doing, um, and we've, I think, gone through now maybe a half a dozen subjects now, and we're, we're, we're pushing forward on it. It's uh, kind of a slow uh, process because it's a neurosurgical intervention. But that got us interested in, and, and listen, if, if I start losing you, anyone who starts sort of thinking, I'm lost here, I want you to wave, wave your hand at me because I'll back up and go through it again. Okay, so. GDNF works because it binds to a particular receptor on nerves, and the nerves respond to that receptor when the GDNF binds to it. And in this case, the receptor is called GFR alpha 1, pretty complicated name, but it binds to another protein, which is the business end of the receptor and does the intracellular signaling that says to the cell, hey, stretch out, live a little, you know. So, um, and the thing about this that's very uh, that you've got to uh, get is that in all cells, actually, there are these cholesterol-rich domains. We always hear cholesterol is bad, but it's actually very, very important. And they're these little domains that bring a lot of signaling molecules together in one place. And when GDNF binds to its receptor, it recruits this business end of the molecule into the lipid graft and triggers the signaling. And so, the composition of that lipid graft and all the other things in it are also important as well in ways that we don't completely understand. It. So I'm going to just go off in a tangent and then I'm going to come back. Don't be scared. Okay, so here's this thing that I suddenly, while I was thinking about this, I saw this paper from this guy, Robert Ladine at Rutgers, and it was a really cool thing because there's a there are these lipids called ganglicides. They're found in lipid rafts. And if you make a mouse that can't make these ganglicides, they get Parkinson's disease. That's pretty cool, spontaneously, right? So the green is showing the ganglicides, and the red is showing the tyrosine hydroxylase. And when you knock out the gene that makes the ganglicide, these neurons begin to fail, and they look sick. And, uh, and the animals start to get resting tremor, and they get movement disorders. They get a lot of the things that we uh, see in human Parkinson's. It's the first animal that's ever been found that does this, which is why it's so exciting. But we went on a little bit further, and we made a cell line where we did the same thing. And you can see here that this is um, GDNF stimulating this intracellular signaling, like a tissue, and here's the, uh, the same cells where we've deleted the enzyme, and you can see that now 
there's a big shift in the response to GDNF. Now the cells are resistant to GDNF in the same way that people with type 2 diabetes are resistant to the action of insulin, right? Now, this, the levels of GDNF in the brain are tiny. They're way down here, which means that when you make cells even a little depleted in GM1 ganglioside, GDNF signaling fails. And why is that important? Because GDNF is the message that the brain gives to these neurons, keep doing what you're doing. Neurons are very insecure. They need to be told all the time, no, do this, go here, grow there. If they don't get that signal, what do they do? They start to shrivel up. Okay. This basically just, I'm gonna whiz through this because it just shows that when you, um, when you um, knock out the, uh, the, in these mice, when you knock out the, uh, the ganglicide, um, you, um, you basically knock out uh, all of the, uh, the signaling which we can detect, detect through a special antibody. I'm not going to do this. But the important thing is that this, this signaling, this GDF signaling has failed in patients, much more important than mice, right? Okay, so here's, um, Here's the, um, this is a thing, this is showing that the receptor is turned on, it's called phosphoret. And here's the tyrosine hydroxylase showing that the, the neurons are there. And then you can see that when you merge the two pictures, you get the yellow because it's green plus when it gives you yellow. I didn't know that, but apparently that's true. Um, and so it means now that this signaling is doing just fine. These are two representative patients. In Parkinson's disease, obviously there's fewer T tyrosine hydroxylase positive cells, but no hands raised, that's good. Either you're very shy or I'm doing a good job. Um, so, but then you can see there is no phosphoret. This receptor is not functional, it's not working. That, I believe, is the core, the fundamental issue with, um, with Parkinson's disease. Failure of GDNS signaling brought about by a failure in ganglioside. Now why is, what, so what's the deal with GM1 ganglioside, okay? So I should just run back. So that basically this is just quantifying a whole bunch of patients and you can see that this, the, the red kinase, the kinase signaling through the receptor is, is defective. Okay, so when you look at patients with Parkinson's disease, they have, oops, sorry, they have a lot less, significantly less GM1 ganglioside. There's other ganglicides that they're not deficient in at all. It seems to be associated with this guy called GM1. And GM1 and GM1 are on the same, they're metabolizing each other. So if you have less GM1 ganglicide, you have less GDNF signaling. And less GDNF signaling is giving you like this. We don't know why there is less GM1 in the brains of people with Parkinson's. All we know is it's less. Okay, so um, I'm going to just jump through this one. But let me get to this final slide here because this goes back to the beginning, right? So here's the pancreas of a normal person. Here's the pancreas. Now, why is it? so? So this this image is um, is a PET scan, and it's it's looking at uh, cholinergic nerve endings. It's looking at acetylcholinesterase, actually. Um, why is this important? These neurons depend on another growth factor. They were nerve growth factor. They depend on this stuff called nerve growth factor. Nerve growth factor cannot signal unless there's a decent amount of GM1 ganglioside around. So the thing that's linking failure of cholinergic innovation to failure of dopaminergic innovation is GM1 ganglioside that is required for signaling through their respective receptors. And so we think that by developing pharmaceuticals that can mimic GM1 ganglioside, we will be able substantially uh, reverse and uh, treat the progression of Parkinson's disease. And so what I'm doing now, we're working with a uh, biotech company to screen for a drug that does this, using the cell line I talked about earlier on, and we have you know, other 
other um, things that we're doing as well to, to address this issue. I should point out that this is not sort of high in the sky because Jay Schneider in Philadelphia has actually done a clinical trial, and is doing clinical trials, with actual GM1 ganglion I mean, why wouldn't you just give people a lot? Well, if you do, it has an effect. The problem is it doesn't get into the brain very well, it's not very efficient. We need a much more efficient way to do it. But I think today we have a vision of what causes Parkinson's disease and what to do about it. And I'm happy to tell you that we're actually doing it. So, um, so I think I missed, I missed, I missed you, right? You, you have a question. Why don't you ask? Are you born with it? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, some people might be, um, but I think um, I, I am a very much of the belief that Parkinson's disease is caused by a pathogen. Um, because only a pathogen really explains the movement of the disease up from the gut into the brain. I'm one of those, probably those small, hardy crew of people believe that, but recently it's been shown that um, Lou Gehrig's disease is probably caused by a retrovirus that they've isolated now. Um, there's a lot of discussion about things like Alzheimer's disease and pathogens. We know that our big enemy is pathogens. Um, so, um, so it's possible that these, you know, this is an acquired disease. Um, and, um, and it may be that, for example, an invading pathogen, for some reason or other, either needs GM1 ganglicide and uses it as a fuel or some, for some reason we don't understand. Um, or that it impairs the ability of cells to make human gamosite. Now, that, those are really big issues, and, and we're really not there yet, but that's, that's definitely a good thing. Anyway, I think uh, just with that, I'm just, I'm just running up to 30 minutes here. I'm just going to thank uh, Chris Benkevich, who's been enormously tolerant for me to do this work, and Pio Adachik has worked very closely with me, and I'm a collaborator of Bob Ledeen at, uh, at Rutgers work with me on, on the mouse work. So anyway, so thank you very much for your time. I hope this is good. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Did you know about that study? No, I don't, but, uh, but it's certainly consistent with the idea. Talking about it. So it's certainly consistent with the idea that the vagus nerve is so, so for those of you who don't yeah, no one loves the vagus nerve. It's the thing that is the main sort of cable that connects your gut to your brain. It's how you're, so it, and it's a two-way street. You know, the brain sends signals down to the vagus, and the vagus sends signals up to the brain. And um, and it can do things like sense infection. It can tell when you have infections. It can tell all sorts of things. It's always got all these little feelers out, trying to find out what the heck is going on down there. And so it's a perfect place for a pathogen to enter uh, the nervous system. <laughs> and, it, and in fact, you know, the guy, Hyperbreath, that I talked about earlier on, um, the neuroanalyst is very strongly of the opinion that this is a pathway for a pathogen to enter the brain. So I think there's very, uh, very good reason to think why that can fail. Um, yeah, actually the study that was just, just being reported in the last few days uh, confirm that with vagotomy, patients who'd undergone a vagotomy, which is done for, um, for reasons of um, uh, abdominal problems, so surgical problems involving the stomach and intestine, uh, those people have a lower incidence of Parkinson's disease, supporting what you've just been saying. You also made the comment that I think that um, the dopaminergic cell loss was not as, uh, as much as people thought, but that there was that they were sick neurons and, and the enzyme systems were not working properly. That's a, a, a remarkably promising statement for the future. It suggests that in the future there may be treatments to help people reverse, to recover functions in neurons that are sick and not functioning properly at the moment. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I absolutely. Really spell this out. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, you know, it's, um, it's, and so, so actually, one of the, one of the things that inadvertently 
research is indeed to kind of not harm the field, but but they but gave it a, a sort of a, a slant. So what we do when we make an animal have experimental partners is we just go in and shoot those neurons in the head. I mean, we give them a toxin that just kills those cells. But that's not, I mean, it produces Parkinsonian symptoms, but it's not producing Parkinson's. And one of the things that we're so excited about with this little mouse that I told you about is it really seems to get Parkinson's. It's a degenerative process. They get, they get resting tremor. They start shuffling around slowly. They have um, weird protein aggregates in their neurons in their gut. And so this is the most faithful model of Parkinson's disease we've ever discovered, actually. And it wasn't even thought, it wasn't developed by Parkinson's researchers. It was just a fortuitous uh, discovery. But, um, but yeah, that's, uh, it is really very helpful. And that's why, for example, with our GDNF trial, our goal there is to put enough GDNF in the brain to really regrow <coughs> those neurons and to get, get uh, a lot of recovery. So I think, uh, and let me just put in a plug there for UCSF. So the GDNF trial that you, did, that you heard about earlier on in this talk was actually planned, designed at UCSF. And then <coughs> the NIH decided they couldn't afford the trial, <coughs> so they said that they would do it themselves. So they simply took the, our design, our, our, our plan, proposal, and are performing the trial at the NIH in, 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 uh, in Washington. But So I thought you might like a bit, little bit of local history. There's time for one last question, and, and the lady over there raised her hand. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, I actually, I, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to put a bunch of questions into one question, and maybe you can answer what you feel you can answer. Sure. Uh, one is, um, if you've got you feel two minutes that, to answer. Them, so. Okay. <laughs> if you feel that it's it's possible a retrovirus could be causing Parkinson's, have you been studying the use of antiretrovirals or any of the AIDS drugs in these patients? The next question is, I've read about uh, possibility of prion disease in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and I don't know if you can speak to that. Um, another one is, there's a, I don't know if anyone has seen the, it's all over the internet about this uh, cancer drug. Nilotinib, um, showing great promise in cancers uh, in uh, Parkinson's so, disease. So may I stop you there? We're going to answer that last question with the next speaker. Okay. And uh, so we can just take the first few questions, then we're going to have to stop. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's entirely possible. So it turns out that 8% of, of our DNA is actually made of retrovirus. <laughs> So it, we have a lot of foreign DNA that we carry. Actually, only 10% of the DNA that I'm carrying is mine. It's like, and same for you too, I suppose. But um, <laughs> it should sound like in the hobbit of habit of going around stealing people's DNA. But, but you know, there's microbial DNA in our guts, and there's retroviruses in our system, and that sort of stuff. So, so the jury's still out. We've actually started looking. Uh, initially, we just looked for bacteria. We have not found any bacterial sequences, um, but it's not stopping us from looking. It may be a long and complicated story, um, so it's not really clear as to what it actually might be. There's, a, you know, there's, there's fungus, there's yeast, there's uh, mycoplasma, there's all kinds of things. So, so that's a good question. As far as the, um, any more, any other yeah. Yeah, so, so just seconds. very quickly, Brian. I, okay, I. I don't contest that I really wish the chat might be about clients because I don't really believe in that idea at all, not even a little bit. Um, and, you know, I guess, it, I just hope to say Bruce was not in the way he's not. Okay, good. So, uh, but, yeah, I, don't, I just don't, it, it's, the problem is it's too out there. And as I said at the beginning of my talk is you've got to bring everybody in. It's got to be comprehensive. And the problem with the prion hypothesis is that it's it's like a black swan. It's just way out there, and you know there might be something to it. But then, how does how does the prion idea explain all of the other things that I just told you about? And the answer is it actually can't. And that's the basic deficiency with that idea. Okay. So if I might just add a word about the prions, the the issue came up because <clears throat> certain degenerative diseases 
are characterized by the accumulation of abnormal proteins. And those proteins may be infective. So they can pass from one cell to an adjacent cell. And some years ago, there was a study done in the United States in two different centers in which people with Parkinson's disease underwent surgery in which fetal substantia nigra cells, so fetal cells from a part of the brain affected in Parkinson's disease, were injected into their brain. Okay? And the study was not helpful in terms of uh, uh, treating their Parkinson's disease. When some of those patients died from other causes and came to autopsy, it was found that some of the transplanted cells, these were fetal cells now, had now got the same protein accumulations as had been found um, in their own cell, original cells. And that provided some support for this concept of infective proteinaceous particles or prions un underlying this disease. Dr. Prusner, who as you know got the Nobel Prize for, for the prion work in 1997, uh, I know does believe quite strongly in the possibility of many of the neurodegenerative diseases having a basis in, uh, in, in related to prions, but that's the sort of evidence that led him to come to that conclusion with regard to Parkinson's disease. All right.